The March for Life in Washington, D.C. has been canceled this year. It was scheduled for January 29th. Now, leaders have blamed the cancellation on COVID-19 and the Capitol Hill riot on January 6th. Now, COVID didn't seem to shut down any other protests that raged at the apex of this crisis. But joining me now to discuss the future of the pro-life movement in the era of Catholic President Joe Biden is former co-chair of the Congressional Pro-Life Caucus, Congressman Dan Lipinski, and president of the Susan B. Anthony List, Marjorie Dannenfelser. Thank you both for being here. Now, a new administration has taken over, one that is not at all friendly to the pro-life movement. As I mentioned earlier, the USCCB issued a controversial statement about Biden's record on life. Where are we at this moment, Marjorie, as this new administration comes in? Well, there's no question that on the federal level, we are on the complete defense. Without question, they will immediately move in and overturn every positive executive order that the pro-life movement, along with the past administration, built. They, when they have an opportunity, will um, will uh, get federal judges in that we don't like, without question, that are not pro-life. Um, and, you know, in, in, in the name of Catholicism, they'll be speaking out for the, quote, pro-choice position, which, of course, doesn't exist within the church. So the bully pulpit, pulpit of the presidency will be used for nefarious means that will undermine life. The real strength of the pro-life movement, however, I believe, and I know, is, uh, is in the real world beyond the D.C. borders where states are working very hard to pass laws that save lives that I believe now the court can really hear and perhaps up uphold. Mm -hmm. Dan, you were a Democratic lawmaker for years. Um, is, is, is there an understanding here, um, I guess, among the, the ranks of, of your former party, that there's political advantage to be gained by supporting things like the Hyde Amendment or the Mexico City policy? Are there Democrats who, who see the political opportunity there? Well, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what uh, President Biden decides to do. Uh, I agree with Marjorie. The executive orders are very likely to, to occur and to occur soon. Uh, I think the uh, mm -hmm. pro-life movement is going to, we, we need immediately to work to protect the, the Hyde Amendment. And that's going mm -hmm. to mean, that, that means reaching out to Democrats in both the House and the Senate uh, to protect it. But, you know, last, uh, last Congress, Nancy Pelosi, uh, decided it wasn't politically uh, a, uh, a good move to go after the Hyde Amendment for whatever reason, whether that's because she knew President Trump would, uh, would veto it or because it wouldn't get through the Senate. Uh, but um, I have to wonder if... Uh, I, I don't think the votes are there to overturn Hyde, but we need to be very active in reaching out to those members, those Democratic members, uh, to make sure that uh, we do preserve Hyde. Mm -hmm. and, and the Hyde Amendment, uh, uh, Congressman Lipinski, explained to people briefly, this is a prohibition on federal funds being used to, to support and pay for abortions, correct? Correct. So it's no taxpayer funding for abortion, but the Hyde Amendment has to be attached to the appropriations bills every year. Uh, so it mm. has to affirmatively be placed on. It's not a it's not a matter of a, a new law repealing it, uh, but right. uh, so that's what we we need to make sure that we're fighting for when it comes to Congress. Yeah, it, 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 I scratch my head, Congressman Lipinski, as to why Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, when they had both houses, didn't make a law to codify this idea that you don't pay for abortions federally. They should have done that. Again, missed opportunity. Uh, Republicans have a real problem with governance, it seems to me. They're great on the opposition. Governance, not so much. Uh, there are people within the pro-life movement who feel that the association with Donald Trump has somehow damaged that movement. In a recent interview, a CNA interview, a Catholic theologian and former Democrats for Life member Charles Comacy said, Proximity to power in order to do genuine good in the short run is a huge temptation, and those of us who never supported Trump should acknowledge the good things that were done. It would have been difficult enough to try to undo the damage that having the pro-life movement associated with Trump, even without the assault on the Capitol, but now the task is absolutely gargantuan. It is far too late to sever ties now. Marjorie, has Trump damaged this movement, or is this the left looking to shut down anyone who's pro-life? 
It's just breathtaking, that statement, it defying all of reality, what has happened over the last four years, where the country has been transformed into one where our courts can actually hear the argument, potentially overturn Roe versus Wade within a relatively short period of time, possibly, and somehow this is irreparable damage. Well, it's damage perhaps to, I think, uh, what some people consider our perfect um, and amicable and pleasing reputations and what feels comfortable. Yes, it's damaging to our comfort levels, but you can ask uh, you know, any person who ever went, ran a, a successful human rights battle like William Witherspoon, like abolitionists and others, that yet yeah, there will be times when people say, you are just anathema. You are really not one of us. You're not part of our crowd, but we are so grateful for the fact that they did what they did. Right now, we are looking at, a, at, at potentially, when it comes to the most important font, the font for every other right, the right to life could possibly be preserved in our, um, because of their rootedness in our founding documents and that we could see the overturn of Roe versus Wade is the only argument to make right now. Our reputations, what people think about us, we tell our kindergartners every day, don't worry about that, do the right thing, move forward. Look, Raymond, we're definitely on the defense, we're definitely on the Hyde Amendment. Uh, that debate is definitely uh, a concerning one. Um, and uh, the Democrats now have embraced the most extreme form of abortion absolutism there is, that we all pay for it domestically in here. But you know what? The most important thing that's happening, and I don't think that'll prevail. I think Dan, uh, Congressman Lipinski is right. But where we will prevail, where the great hope is, is out in the states where real people are letting their voices be known through great governors and a very narrow margin in the House and the Senate uh, and, and a barely winning presidency is not going to change the reality that is moving forward in our nation. Great hope mm -hmm. and great strength in the pro-life movement. Congress, uh, Congressman Lipinski, your take on uh, trying to connect somehow the pro-life movement to this uh, mob riot at, uh, at the Capitol. I mean, I didn't see sidewalk counselors storming the House cloakroom there. Maybe I missed that part. Well, uh, that is a, a terrible. I mean, look, the 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 riot at the Capitol w was awful, uh, but mm -hmm. trying to then attach everyone who uh, someone may not like to to that uh, is you know really irresponsible. Uh, it is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, this was not the pro-lifers attacking the uh, the House of Representatives. But look, moving forward, we need to have a a new face to the pro-life movement. I'm hopeful that's going to be Amy, Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, I don't think we could have a better face of the pro-life movement uh, than her. And uh, I, I'm very hopeful in that. I, we know if Roe v. Wade is overturned, uh, this is going to become a much tougher battle. It's going to have to be waged in the states. And we are also going to need pro-life Democrats, and we need to build up. Uh, mm -hmm. The Democratic Party at the top is terrible on pro-life, but still it's 25 to 30 percent of Democratic voters, and we need to build up uh, pro-life Democrats. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. Uh, look, our, our governor here in Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, is a pro-life Democrat, but he's one of the very few. He's also a pro-gun Democrat, and this is why he won re-election, by the way. So, uh, look, I, I, I think particularly for Catholics, you got to stay on the issue. Forget the party, stay on the issue. And if Democrats were smart, they would want to be a governing party forever and drop this litmus test on abortion. They'd become captive to Planned Parenthood and a few of these groups. And, uh, and frankly, it's distorting their long-term political possibilities here. Marjorie, I found this CNA piece, frankly, ridiculous uh, on, uh, you know, whether the alliance with Trump has damaged the, the pro-life movement. Would it have been better if Hillary Clinton had been president for pro-lifers? Well, you make the, the exact point. In politics, you generally have two choices, one candidate or the other. You have one that mm -hmm. completely moved the Hyde Amendment into, the, into debate again, as if anybody, uh, any majorities are ever going to embrace that position, um, and who uh, promised that she would only have Supreme Court justices that would affirm and uphold Roe versus Wade. And then you have on the other side a man who made commitments that many people didn't believe or take them at face value, um, but he committed to exactly the opposite and to upholding a pro-life presidency and a pro-life country. Uh, and he did exactly that. He followed through on those promises. Maybe he made some people uncomfortable along the way. 
and certainly the very end didn't feel like ending strong. However, decades from now, we will have forgotten many of these things, uh, and we will have a much stronger jurisprudence that will be protecting the lives of little boys and girls who are intended for this world every single day. Mm -hmm. And so it was the right thing to do if you voted for the pro-life candidate for president and every other candidate that is a pro-life candidate across the country. Mm. Dan, uh, you did not attend the March for Life in 2018 when you found out that President Trump was going to uh, share a video address there. You said at the time you did not want to be in, quote, the potentially morally compromised situation, uh, presumably of sharing a stage with a president whose words were unpredictable and even offensive. Uh, rhetoric aside, he has been the most pro-life president in the history of the country. I mean, that's not to be disputed. We now have a Catholic president pledged to repeal the Hyde Amendment, codify Roe v. Wade into law. Your thoughts, and should Catholics, including politicians, avoid sharing the stage with Biden, given his anti-life policies and his stated agenda? Well, uh, my concern about President Trump was, as you said, you never know what's going to come out of his mouth. Uh, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. No president in the history of our country has come close to doing as much when it comes to executive orders and, and the courts uh, to protect the unborn. And no question about that. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my concern is that he became the face of the pro-life movement. I think that certainly mm -hmm. hurt me in, in my primary uh, for yeah. President Trump. And in, in, in so many ways, it gave the other side the opportunity to say that is the type of person who who is pro-life in the things in his life and the things that he said uh, I think that was damaging but you know we we move beyond that uh, move beyond that right now and that's why I say look we need to win hearts and minds uh, that's something that's very mm -hmm. important I know Marjorie has been in, involved in conversations about post Roe v Wade and what we need to be preparing for and I think that's very important for, for us to do. Uh, I think Joe mm -hmm. Biden, I, let me say that the statement by the USCCB I thought was spot on. I think all Catholics should, should read that. Uh, everything that's been talked about, uh, about uh, counts about uh, abortion, the Catholic position on abortion and, and gender and religious freedom, uh, all that I stand with the Catholic Church on, that came about halfway through, but that's all you're reading about. It was a very balanced, view of what a Catholic who is in public life and public office should stand for. And uh, we he need to pray that President Biden has a change of heart on these issues. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, on Monday, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi joined Hillary Clinton for a podcast. I want to play this for both of you because the issue of abortion and President Trump came up. I want your reaction. Now, there's one other element that I have been talking about for a long time that gives me great grief as a Catholic. I think that Donald Trump is president because of the issue of woman's right to choose. Mm -hmm. When he signed that paper saying, these are the judges that I will appoint, that was the dog whistle to the evangelicals, to the Catholics, and all the rest. A woman will not have the right to choose. And many of these people are um, very good people. That's just their point of view. But they were willing to sell the whole democracy down the river for that one issue. Willing to sell the whole democracy down the river for that one issue. Now, this is the line you hear from partisan Catholics, particularly on the left. Marjorie, your reaction? My reaction is that in all of politics, in all of the time that I've been involved as a Catholic convert and as a pro-life advocate, I have never been so annoyed, deeply offended, appalled at what someone, at, at what a, a self-described devout Catholic would say about people who took the pro-life position um, important as, as preeminently important, which is exactly the way that the church itself describes it. And that, and that somehow uh, we are undermining the Constitution that somehow we are bad patriots, that we're not helpful in forming a democratic republic because we care so much about the pro-life position is outrageous. It's outrageous that um, that she, as a private citizen, uh, would take that to the public sphere. The piece of paper that she refers to, I know very well what it was. It was the commitment that he made to us at the Susan B. Anthony list, along with a couple of other commitments, that he would only appoint pro-life 
Supreme Court justices and federal judges along the line. That's what she's talking about. That is the biggest change that was made in his entire administration and what he will be, if not remembered for, what later we will thank him for. And that she thinks that somehow that that was an abrogation of a, uh, that, that for Catholics, it was an abrogation of our responsibility in public life um, to uh, to vote for him, uh, you know, over Hillary Clinton um, is just making the church in her own image. It is not the Catholic church that she's a part of, if that's what she thinks that is a, is um, uh, how we make our decisions as private people and public people in, uh, in political life. Congressman Lipinski, uh, the, this one is so-called one issue only applies to people of a certain political stripe. I mean, look, I have a lot of friends on the left and the right who they're they're enraged about uh, public executions, about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the death penalty. Um, and, and they're rightly enraged about that. But there were 17 executions last year. The CDC reports there were only over 600,000, probably closer to 800,000 abortions last year. So shouldn't they summon the same outrage over those lives that, 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 were, that were tossed away? I mean, how do you get out of the political back and forth and focus everyone on the human rights dimension of this, no matter the politics? Well, two things I'd say. First, I think uh, Speaker Pelosi needs to take a step back and, and look in, at this and say, well, if all those voters are voting, you know, put Donald Trump in. And I made this, I, I, I said this for, for years. Um, mm. If all these people put Donald Trump in because of the radical position that the Democratic Party has taken on abortion, Democrats should learn and to back mm -hmm. off of that radical position. And that's the case that, that I've been making to the party uh, mm -hmm. over the last few years as the party has gotten become more radical on that. But the second thing is, look, we need as Catholics to be Catholic first before party. And, and that's what, uh, what I've always said. Uh, that's the message that uh, I have. I think people who are talking about our tribalism in this country and all the problems that it's causing. I say Catholics have the way out. Uh, we can show the way forward if we mm -hmm. are, you know, to have the courage to to be Catholic first before uh, be, before choosing one of these, these these two tribes or one of these political parties. And, and I think right. that should be uh, that's my message to to everyone out there. Uh, uh, Congressman, before I, before I, I, I end this, I want to move on. I want I have one other topic I want to talk about. Do you feel you were targeted by your party because of your pro-life stance? I mean, you were the last of the Mohicans. I don't think there are any other pro-life Democrats in the House, right? Well, there, there's no one left who's always always with us. Uh, but uh, some some who are sometimes. But yes, I mean, no question. I mean, there would not have been $6 million spent against me in the 2018 and 2020 primary if I were not pro-life. That was directly where most of that money came from. I mean, that, that it has just become a, a, a litmus test, of, the number one litmus test, it seems, for the Democratic Party. And I'll go back to the statement of Nancy Pelosi. Uh, if she were a... Uh, if she's worried about the Democratic Party, how about the party take a step back uh, oh, from yeah. that? But um, well, next time, next you know, time we, I hear this, if, next time I hear this, if you'll pardon the phrase malarkey from people saying you're a one issue voter, or you can't be a one issue voter. I'm going to say one word back to them. Lipinski. That's all I'm going to say back to them, because this <laughs> was right. the one issue that they decided to take you to the mat for, even though you were with them on, on so much of the Democratic agenda here. Think how absurd it would sound to say the death of another, that the death of of your neighbors makes you a one issue person. It's absurd to say that. So anybody who does say it doesn't really believe that it's the that it's a death of a human being. I mean, that's the logic of mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and it's not one issue. It's one issue that defines all the other issues of caring for the poor, the environment, capital punishment. If we can't agree that the taking of an innocent human life 
is important to us as a society, then we can't uh, allow that thinking to, bra to, to bleed in all, pardon the pun, bleed into all the other issues of the day. That informs Amen. everything else. So it's not one issue. It's the predominant no. issue that affects so many like dominoes. Uh, I want to get into one other thing before we leave, uh, the, the policy changes we can expect from this administration. This past July, Joe Biden had this to say about the Little Sisters of the Poor when they won the mm -hmm. Supreme Court case, which upheld an exemption for the sisters from that contraceptive mandate, obligating them uh, to provide contraceptives and abortifacient services for their employees. He said, if I'm elected, I will restore the Obama-Biden policy that existed before the Hobby Lobby ruling, providing an exemption for houses of worship and an accommodation for nonprofit organizations with religious missions. What can we expect here? Very quickly, Dan. Yes, that's a good question, and that's something that President Biden really needs to be pushed on by the Little Sisters of the Poor in, in the Catholic Church. Uh, his words suggest he would he would protect them, but we know, reading between the lines, uh, that that policy did not uh, protect the conscience of those of Little Sisters of the Poor and others who did not want to provide uh, the abortifacient. Mm -hmm. Marjorie. Yeah, well, right out of the box, when the Supreme Court decided that last summer, um, Biden said he was going to take him back to court if he could. I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear what he's going to do. And it, it really does come down to conscience. Uh, should we be forced to pay for things? Should we be forced to be involved in things? Should we, no matter our religious convictions, be forced to engage in activity that we believe is the death of another human being? Uh, the Democratic yeah. Party left Catholics um, uh, walked away from him a long time ago, doesn't have any tolerance for any other position. So that's what we can see. The Little Sisters hauled in front of court again. Hmm. Well, look, <laughs> I, I, I agree with both of you. I think Joe Biden has a golden opportunity here to, like Donald Trump, operate and govern outside of the ideological framework of his party. And Donald Trump mm -hmm. did that. He, he, there, he broke a lot of conventions in the Republican Party. I think Biden needs to similarly move to the center and defy some of the, the, the conventions that have been set up there. It would serve him well. By the way, uh, Dr. Fauci, who's going to be speaking to the WHO, in his uh, prepared remarks, says Biden will be uh, lifting the Mexico City policy and allowing uh, abortion funding abroad. So we'll keep monitoring all of this and check in with you in the days ahead. Dan Lipinski, Marjorie Dannenfelser, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you.